The Ensemble podcast is intended for professional financial advisors. This content is created in partnership with our sponsor, Zurich Australia Limited, ABN 92000 010 195 AFSL 232 510 and is limited to publicly available information. Before acting on any general advice, you should consider whether appropriate and obtain financial advice from a qualified financial advisor. Ensemble does not hold an AFS license and does not provide any financial advice or services or endorse any general advice. If a PDS or IM exists, you should obtain a copy and review it thoroughly before making a decision. Hi, I'm Andrew Rocks from Ensemble, and I'm thrilled to be bringing to you uh, the podcast Engine Room. It's devoted entirely to the practices or the business of the business of financial advice. Over the course of the next many months, we're going to be interviewing Australia's best independent boutique advice firms, their practice managers, their GMs, on what environment is conducive to being a best practice how they keep talent, how they attract talent, and what the future of financial advice is. It's the Engine Room Podcast. Welcome aboard. Zurich is proud to be supporting this episode. The Zurich and OnePath Advisor portal is more efficient than ever before, giving you access to two leading brands with three highly sought-after products, underpinned by two powerful underwriting engines, all with one simple sign-on, making it easier for you to do business and perform at your best. Hi, my name's Andrew Rocks, and welcome to the Engine Room Podcast. It's a podcast where we dig into the pra- the business of the business of financial planning. We all know that financial planners um, love to see their clients, but it's the engine that they work inside that allows them to do their best work. And I'm really pumped today to be talking with someone who was described on his own website as an entrepreneur at heart. So let us make that decision. His name's James Millard, and he's from Sufficient Funds. And uh, James, lovely to be catching up with you on the Engine Room Podcast, mate. G'day, Roxy. Thank you very much, mate. Great intro. <laughs> That's fine. And look, we spoke. Uh, we spoke earlier. I'm really interested about uh, your your business. And and look, one of the, the the standout points is that in reality, you've been going for a little bit of time, which you're going to give us a, an overview. I, 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 I look at five, six years, maybe, and you've got 26 team members in your team. And and if you're out there listening, that's a really fast trajectory. Um, so without any further ado, maybe give us an idea of how you've got to this point. And if you could make it funny and a little bit engaging, would help me, please. Mate, I can't promise to have the comedic value that you will add to this, but I'll do my best. So, mate, yeah, look, it, I mean, we we started, I started a business with two others in 2015 when I rolled out of the corporate world. That that was a bit of slow going and, and the three of us made a very amicable split in 2018 where I then started with my wife, Tash, and one other team member at the time, Sufficient Funds. And so, SF for short is sufficient funds is I guess now for us it's it's a mortgage broking and it's a financial planning business. I was always a financial planner at the core, um, but I guess the idea of that uh, that really our goal with starting that business was to be able to create something where we could add the value and help people go through the things that we were going through personally. And so being forty, there's a big backstory uh, if you want to hear a bit about it, um, but. But the backstory is really the end result is that it was a focus on driven millennials and people who are in similar situations to us. So look, we'd had our first, we just had our second child. We were navigating life as dual income, no kids. We'd lived in a couple of capital cities, things like fertility challenges. We went through IVF, raising our young family. Then it was about juggling parental leave, starting a business, starting a family, uh, and everything that comes along with that. And so Long, long story short, and there is a book coming in the next few months, so I'll... Uh, I'll... I can't wait. <laughs> Has it got a name yet, James? It's Insufficient Funds and the Road to Sufficient. Okay, so there's a play on many words there. So, um, But what what just stood out then is, is that's a that's a relatively uh, kind of a noble, noble, a noble pursuit is to, to have the self-awareness to identify your own life's ups and downs and problems and struggles... And then to focus or dedicate your professional career to help others exactly like you is that is that sort of how you've you've got really for us it was I was working with clients who had similar challenges and I could see there was such a big opportunity there and and for us the end result is 
how do we make a connection between life and money? Because for the young millennials that we're working with, life's far impo- more important. Money brings a whole lot of challenges. And, and it's really how do we help that, that second part facilitate the bit that's more important? What are all these things? And there's a huge story there for everyone, right? And you know, I guess for our story, if you go to insufficient funds, this is way, way back, but I was at uni. We were, um, you know, I was, I was fortunate enough to be doing an exchange in Canada and uh, one of the boys pulled out an ATM slip, insufficient funds, the name, we couldn't start a band, we had no talent there, so we ended up, <laughs> we, we printed a bunch of trucker hats and t-shirts and at the same time had bought an old Chrysler LeBaron, so we had one of those old wooden station wagons, wooden panel station wagons, and we kind of lapped the state selling these out of the back of the car, so to speak. Look, our dream was to never work a full-time day in our lives, cash in, sell it to, to you know, do do what Billabong did and, and sell it off or Hurley did to Nike and sell it off for 60 mil and, and move on. But, you know, life got in the way. We, you know, we were back at uni, we finished our degrees, we put our sensible shirts on and, you know, got our full-time jobs with our ties and, and went from there. But I guess the insufficient funds at the time, and I've been blogging a lot about this in, in more recent years before starting the business, was... I guess it never lost traction. The core idea of there, you got this tiny little movement, but for us, it was a bit about having no money, but being able to do something with it. And then sufficient funds now is really looking back on that and going, well, we learned a hell of a lot during that time. And and how can I maybe build something around that with the the money nerd uh, that I naturally have inside me somewhere? There's nothing like quite like it back in the day um, when you'd uh, you'd be at the ATM and the, the insufficient funds would come out and then you'd act like the money was coming out because you didn't want the people behind <laughs> to realise that you just got the pink slip. And I think today with the tap and go, it's the anxiety that, that people have that the little red cross is going to come up. So I'm not sure, but that's that's one of the most sort of interesting uh, um, ways or, or, of designing your, your company name, and I'm sure that resonates um, with a lot of your clients and your team members, James. Big time, and and I guess the team all says it in their own ways. We're all living our own version of sufficient funds, and and you know we can talk about how we our advice process and how that links in and, and the steps that we take there. But um, yeah, I think uh, you know in terms of the backstory, we we're not here without some you know some incredible people but i guess more than anything it's the it's the advice community and and we all know this and this has been said a hundred times but you guys what you're doing with x y and ensemble and facilitating these conversations the best thing about the advice community is everyone's willing to share we're all competitors apparently but uh you know you don't really see that showing up in day to day and if you had to ask someone a question they'll give you the answer And, and you know this is about ideally ideally giving back so there's some motivation there for you know we've got some huge potential here as an industry as a profession and you know let's make it happen yeah exactly and i think you know the the notion of competitors really only exists when you've got a finite number of clients but um i've never met a financial planner in the last five years um who's worried about obtaining clients they're actually more worried about can they deliver the things that they they want and they desire and can they do it that at a price that's both affordable for the client and also palatable for your team and your staff, which is, you know, the whole reason around talking about the, the, the practice management and how you actually build that deliverables. Now, I'm reading your website at the moment and uh, you've got a little comment, who who the bloody hell are we, which is a, you know, a classic Australian uh, <laughs> tourism ad, um, lap shot, lap, laptops and t-shirts. Um, and you said you shook the shackles um, of the corporate world. So you, you very much have that feeling that, that you're working, that you're very aligned with the target market and just repeating the target market millennials. And when you say millennials and the age of 40, it really does date everyone on this, on this call. Um, it's, uh, I'm not sure where we are now. I'm, <laughs> I'm a father of adult children, but, um, yeah, it's, uh, the, the, the CEO of, of, um, Ensemble Clayton is a, is a millennial and he sees like, well, what happens when you become a middle aged millennial? What's the tagline then? I know. And we're, I've probably got a couple of years on Clayton, I think, and uh, especially with the, that beautiful baby face, he still seems to be able to hang on to. But um, we can edit this later. We'll cut that out. Yeah, a hundred percent. So, just just changing gears, um, when you were doing your journey from corporate um, into into advice, and then and you 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 started, and then you had a, and then you've you've re pivoted. Um, was there any sort of uh, events? 
or motivations that shaped you, shaped you, your thoughts other than the, the cool backstory of the name? I think one thing is the the ongoing challenge we seem to have as advisors as a as a as a group, and the fact that everyone put, brings together. Um, there are no, there's no doubt. I mean, everyone knows this. So we don't have to dwell on it. But the the challenges that have been around. But but what happens there is it actually forces you to be really good at what you do. And uh, on top of that, I think for us, the fact that we were working with young people. The, the difference in my experience there really getting stuck into this where we, you know, we've made some really strong partnerships with people who were able to give us quite a, got a solid flow of in, incoming inquiries is all of a sudden you realize that millennials, uh, they, they challenge you on value and you have to articulate it. And if you can't articulate value and get that across in that very first time you touch on, on you know, what you're going to do with them. You've gone. You've gone straight away, and so. And I've got two. I've got two questions to ask there. The the, the first one is, um, you mentioned you've got a, a good flow of clients. I'd like to explore a little bit more about how you uh, uh, attract um, attract clients. Um, but we'll come to that that secondary. The, the second one is, um, yeah, how do you how do you and your team of twenty six articulate that value early on to quite sort of. Um, uh, not skeptical, but just quite inquisitive and very, you know, millennials have the benefit of, of being able to cross-reference everything. They're a generation that, 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 you know, you're the third person they've looked at on the website, not the first. Um, so, so how do you articulate that value early on with the client relationship? So really just with anyone, it is absolutely about understanding what are their problems and what are their challenges. And the thing that comes up for almost everyone that we work with is there's a lot going on. And there always will be. And whether it's trying to buy the first home through to starting the family, through to the challenges that might come with that, starting a business, fluctuating incomes, private school and, and everything through that that core kind of 10, 15 years that we're sort of going through and have been through, career challenges and everything else. There's so much there that everyone we talk to has something or everything uh, you know, going on there. And, and I guess the idea there is, for us, if you can really get clear on what is important to you, what matters, then we can help you build a financial plan that actually links your money decisions to that. And once you understand that you're investing for the right reasons and it makes sense and if the market tanks tomorrow, it has no bearing on the outcome of this, this and this, and that they're the ones that actually matter, then the rest of it falls into place and you stay on track. So how do you get these clients? So we've got um, so a couple of things. So we, we do have a really good, strong, we're probably on a 40% referral basis. So every, every clients great. have a great experience and that's, that's, that's up there for us. Our two main sources of leads come from two big podcasts. So Glenn James, shout out to Glenn and My Millennial Money. She's on the money, Victoria Devine. These guys are doing an incredible job, I guess, waking people up to Absolutely. this ability and ability to really take control of their finances. So the types of introductions that we get from people like this, they're, they're engaged already and they know what they don't know and they're yeah, asking and there, more there's questions. probably a good chance that, that they've listened to quite a few of, of uh, the guys' podcasts um, and they're starting to form and, and maybe do a little bit of that, that, that formation of ideas even before they get to you. And as you've just intimated, the best thing is they know what they don't know um, yeah. and- uh, both of those people, um, Victoria, um, um, uh, with the she, she's on the money, and Glenn and his team um, have made a real fist of actually going out to the general public and promoting, um, you know, basically get to get your act together. Um, which and and so so you then have worked with them as an execution partner for people who um, make further inquiries. Is that right? Yeah, exactly. And I guess that's the. I mean, the the benefit of us to to someone like that is that we can. Over a, over a number of years, we can show that we're looking after their community. They can trust that process. They can trust that we've got capacity, so a decent team. It's not just one advisor trying to pull it all together. There's a really solid team, and I'm, I'm sure we'll get into the pod structure and 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 how we operate all of that uh, as well. And look, what, just to change gears to get into the actual business of the business, um, you mentioned your clients are time poor. Well, I've been through that time zone. They're time destitute. Is that, uh, you know, you mentioned things like... Um, They've got. They might start their own business. They're buying their own home. They're putting their kids through private school. 
was that the inspiration to get a real handle on the mortgages side of it and 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 sort of control the outcome on that cost center? Yeah, I mean, look, going back, going back some time, I I worked in a business where we did everything and mortgages was part of it. So we started that naturally, uh, and I was trying to be a mortgage broker as and a financial planner at the same time, and that worked until we got to a certain level. Uh, I'm glad I'm not doing that anymore. But we, <laughs> you know, I brought in Randy, who I was lucky to have worked with prior. He runs the mortgage broking side of the business. They've got three brokers there now and good pod structure around it. Um, and that works incredibly well. But yeah, back to that, the outcome for the clients is, I mean, I mean, we're seeing it right now, right? The, the, the refinance market is insane, but it's also been, we're talking to so many people who haven't quite bought their first home and just having a, a sounding board and saying, well, what does that what does that look like and what do I need and how do I approach that? Um, the, the two sides of the business, planning and broking, just work so well together. Oh, look, I'm, I'm, you're preaching to the converted with me. It's been the genesis of, of my one. I always thought that if you can, if you can save them, if you can get the best quality life insurance, at, at, at the best quality price, if you can get the efficient frontier of what they pay in mortgages, um, and you can assist them with a you know either a, an in-house or a quality accounting referral, and the client ends up with you know five to ten thousand dollars extra per year, it becomes an easy sell to say, well, I would like to charge a fee for my services to then make you money as well. Yeah, and and on top of that, I think that you know the the common misconception with millennials is they're not willing to spend money, and that's rubbish. They'll, they will absolutely throw money at something if they can see the value in it. And, and that's the key. You've got to create that. But um, yeah, we, we get paid for what we do. That's very important. So you mentioned um, you've got a couple of mortgage brokers, but maybe, maybe give me an idea of um, how you arrange your business uh, to complement the, the, the articulation of how you want to service your clients. Yeah. So... So we've got that we keep the two, the two separate entities, broking and planning. From a planning perspective, we have the advisor that's obviously the key relationship holder and the provider of advice, but that's really all they do. Uh, and, and this had stemmed from me trying to not do anything that I absolutely shouldn't be doing because I get my dirty mitts on things and I break it. Um, it's I need to step back and focus on that, whatever that might be. And it's no longer, you know, one on one with clients as much as it was. Um, and and now we have the good advisor and a, a pod structure around that advisor. So the key our key for advisors is they are relationship people. They have the ability to have conversations and they can engage and they can coach and they're they're active listeners. Uh we then have what we call it an advice to IC which is more like an assistant advisor or associate advisor. They may be doing uh, the PY and working towards it. They may not be, may already be qualified as an advisor who uh, and just wants to work more in a support role but also maybe service some of the ongoing clients. We then have two admin in that one pod. Uh, one's for onboarding, everything up to getting through the presentation of a plan, and then the other one is for implementation. And so that's applications and seeing it through to completion there. And then we have a power planner. We have a power planning team that we share between the pods. Um, and we're working on how that kind of fits into that exact structure. But they're all internal. We used to, we used to outsource a lot of that stuff. Um, but now internally, when I say internal, uh, half the teams in the Philippines. Yep. Uh, we see them as an extension of us. So it's, uh, it's all internal in my mind. <laughs> well, a quick glance at your website. There's no difference between, um, and we'll get to where all of your team are, but even your advisors and your, your two ICs, and I do believe that Advice 2IC might be a completely unique name to your own business. Um, I personally love it. So if I'm an advisor and I've got an Advice 2IC, does that mean that, that the advisors um, does a lot of the onboarding of the new clients and potentially the 2IC is assisting in, in reviewing the portfolios? That's right, um, and and also helping build the strategy and everything up to delivery of that advice. And so, being that connection with a bit of experience who understands strategy and and everything else that's really important there, to then be the connection between the admin side of the client services part and and the advisor themselves, so that they can come out of a meeting. Not we're not sitting in each other's meetings, um, but we but we will record uh, or do a quick loom wrap up to then summarize and move on. Uh, and that's imperative. Uh, uh, just that cost efficiency and keeping the advisor in front of clients ideally is 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 the only way to do it for us. Cool. And for the uninitiated, Loom's a piece of software that helps you record your, your meetings there. So 
with the, the the types of clients you articulated up front um, and having a lending business, um, is it safe to say that you do have quite a, a large demand for, for life insurance? Is that, a, is that a key part, estate planning life insurance of your business? Yeah, definitely is. Definitely is. And, you know, it's an interesting, it's an interesting thing for us because we were about a year and a half ago, and this was leading up to the changes with income protection. We were doing risk only plans and okay. we've we switched that to now focusing. And this was a, a tough decision to make, but it's something we really challenged in terms of profitability. Spitting out a risk only plan for us where we had the team working on so much other, you know, really important stuff around the goal planning and, and the bigger plans that we write. We made the call to drop that as a service offering and just offer a holistic service that includes risk. So we knew what we're doing. We'd done a heap of it. Um, I think we submitted something like 300 insurance applications in the last couple of weeks of uh, would have been October 21 wow. uh, with the income protection changes and uh, you know, we we had we had that, but we just had to look. I was just looking at the cost of delivering it, and in the end, the team was very thankful for the the pressure that that came off after the end of October uh, by saying we'd focus a little bit more on our holistic service. Which in the end, that's that's our core value. That's what we're absolutely best at, and that's the reason we made that decision. Oh, look! If you're passionately aligned with with that as a service and you deliver it, then that's that's all you need to all you need to do. Um, and we, how much face time do your advisors get? It seems like they've got quite a bit of support. What with a 2IC, with an implementation, with a, someone who's organizing research and whatnot, and also a, a sort of a consolidated power planning team. If I'm working for you and I'm an advisor, um, what sort of face time do I get with clients as a percentage? So you'd be doing anywhere from 15 to 20 hours a week. And so that's... Um you know, that's a spread between, I mean, there's there's the phone calls, there's the initial call, yep. there's our defying sufficient session, which is an hour and a half. Uh, there's another meeting before presenting the plan, which is an hour, and then the plan presentation could be up to two hours. Um, and it's, you know, multiple of those each week. Now, you mentioned that you, um, uh, you've got some uh, team members in the Philippines. Um, what was your philosophy around uh, you're your, your growing your global team? And also maybe give us a feel for... Um, uh, where is your team located at the moment? Oh, given yeah. that you're you're a Newcastle native, um, lots of pictures of you at the beach. I'm um, on your <laughs> website having a bit of fun, but um, but that's not necessarily your business per se. No, so look, I, I grew up in Grafton and I came to uni in Newcastle. That's where I met my, my wife Tash. We ended up in Brisbane for a couple of years. We're in Sydney for twelve, uh, nearly over a decade in the end, and and back to Newy more recently, the last couple of years. So, um, I as part of our transition from your from our original business as part of our transition from the original business into building sufficient funds there was a heavy element of our clients are not coming into the city they're not coming there they don't want to come see us so we're doing video meetings anyway we were just wasting so much time commuting that we ended up completely remote and uh that was a that was a short-term solution what year was that james relative to covid Oh, uh, well, well before we were, um, that was, that was 2016. Right. So a little bit before COVID brought the, uh, brought the necessity and, and thankfully for us, we we're, you know, already very well equipped, luckily, uh, for all of that. But it was a move that we'd made when we were small and, uh, very easily managed at that point. But we made, we turned that into an intention and, and it moved then from now where we are now. We have no location. We don't have a head office. We don't have an office anywhere. And uh, we've got team in Australia from Cairns down to Tassie. And uh, uh, as I said before, we're talking about the Philippines. We've got a half our teams in the Philippines as well. So uh, in terms of structure, we anyone can work from anywhere. We don't mind that. Um, we've got to, you know, do a lot around engagement and make sure that we're still catching up and doing all that type of thing. Um, but yeah, really, really works well. Well, I'm probably going to touch on that a bit later on around how you 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 manage your people and your culture, given what you've just articulated there. But um, in relation to the the technology stack that that you, you utilise, um, what what do you use? What do you like? What can be improved? So we've got Active Campaign that we use more to engage, uh, and we and we use that to flow to follow the flow of clients through that, especially those the kind of the first hundred days, that first creating the plan and, and from there. We use Basecamp, which is project management software. Uh, it's Basecamp 4 now, um, which 
we used to use Asana, and which is similar, and Slack, Basecamp, we found, combined the two of them and would allow communication on clients. And the client becomes an individual project. And then it builds from there. And so you can create task lists off the back of that that flow for every individual client. You can cut in and add what's what's required and take out what's not uh, and, t- and, and really allocate everything. So that's our workflow system, essentially. Uh, then we've got uh, the... The base of everything is is Gmail, Google. So we use Google Drive, uh, Gmail, found the search function, the integrate integrations. Whilst I think Microsoft is definitely catching up, but we just found that was uh, and has been incredibly strong there. Um, X Plan is our core for spitting out plans. Uh, we use it for what we absolutely have to. Um, we have found, and, and this is probably licensee driven probably for the most part in what we're using there, but X plan from the ones we've looked at in terms of the modeling that we do, and this is where the power planner role is so key to us, is that initial that modeling uh, and the short-term modeling, especially the first five years. I don't, I don't believe in long-term plans. Uh, in a yeah, 30-year modeling for someone who's 30 years old because everything changes tomorrow. But that first few years is imperative and having good software there to get that right is where we actually bring a lot of our value uh, for these people. Um, so on top of that, we're using our, our payment gateways, Stripe, and that links in through Calendly. So booking through Calendly, everything flows straight into it, into the calendar from there, into through Gmail, everything's everything's stored in Google Drive uh, and Stripe automates payments. Oh, perfect. Thanks. And look, it sounds like um, um, having, building those workflows in, in Basecamp 4, I'm familiar with Asana. I'm, I haven't worked with Basecamp, but you've you've piqued my interest there. Um, uh, it enables your remote team to actually make sure the ball isn't dropped with the client because it's uh, once they log in there, they can see, oh, that's, we're on. You know, this project hasn't been finished. It, it, there's no There's nowhere to hide, is there? That's right. Yeah, it's it's very it's very good. It shows everyone's activity. It shows what they're working on. It's one of those helpful ta- helpful items where you're talking about a remote team. They could be literally anywhere. Um, so we can see what they've done today. We can see what they did yesterday. We can see what's still outstanding. Uh, so that's really important. And do you, um, in relation to your mortgage breaking, do you run the full financial planning process and then refer them into the mortgage breaking business, or is there a level of integration there? There's a level of integration that really depend on the client. I mean, there's sometimes we're having that initial conversation. There's like straight away, we need to save some money and we've got a mortgage and, you, you know, you just ask the right questions there and, and send it straight over. Um, if if it generally, I would say it's better to run through the process and make the referral after or the intro, introduction afterwards. Um, but it can go both ways, of course. And, you know, one of our, our challenges that we're still working on, but I think we've got a lot better at it since that change from risk only offering to dropping that was was now it's a it's a more difficult conversation for a mortgage broker to introduce an entire financial plan than it is to just say, hey, you got a debt, you need to you need to cover that. Right. Um so that's a work in progress for us, but we we are seeing we're we're, we're educating the, the brokers really around the value of what we do. Uh and and that's the starting point. If you can have a conversation around that for the most part, that's that's the key. And look, the when when you're actually now um, doing people's overall goals, do you do much investments? And if you do, do you have a uh, do 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 you run your investments in portfolios? Or just give us a bit of a feel. And is there any platforms that work for you that you like dealing with? Um, yeah. Go for it. Yeah. So our our licensing has always been fairly uh, open, fairly platform agnostic in terms of that. So we've. We chose NetWealth a long, long time ago and just haven't haven't found any need to leave. Uh, the the support we get through the BDMs like Rachel Colligan are insane. Uh, it's really, really helpful. Um, and that that goes for any BDM that or you know jumps in. There's so much value that they can add when they do a good job and when they're receptive. So yeah, massive shout out to people like Rachel, um, people like Bez from Neos. Uh, d- they do an incredible job. We're we're very open to using all sorts of different insurers and, and investment products that we absolutely do. Um, but sometimes the cream of the crop rise to the top with the with the service delivery, especially, and they're very helpful. And that's the I guess a key for us to be able to continue doing what we're doing. Um, in terms of investment approach, we we like to keep it simple, but we can dial it up when needed. And so, in ter- my my personal view on this is your behaviour. Is going to, especially for the people we're working with, right? But they don't have five million dollars, and it's not managing that to beat the market. It's about 
someone putting more away on a more regular basis and understanding the impact of that. And so the outcome is often it's an index type scenario or it might be a core and satellite. Um, the fact that we're not we're not um, you know we're not placing huge value from a client perspective on that because we're not telling them that we're stockbrokers. We're not trying to beat the market. It's just literally about placing it in something that's appropriate and reviewing it annually. We 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 still have that as a fairly manual approach in terms of we have a good set of uh, the kind of satellite funds that we like to use and and then focus more on the core side of things for the most part. Oh, and look, your 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 people are going to contribute to wealth. Um, their contributions are, are what it is, and you really need to have that 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 discipline. Or, or get them to have that discipline, and they do that by trusting trusting your process, and and also by really buying in to the process and the vision and the goals, etc. Because people need a reason why. They also need it to be easy. Um, you mentioned that that um, you've got time poor people. The tech stack that you've you've intimated from Stripe to Calendar, you're reducing friction at every possible point, because and and you've removed uh, commuting, you've removed friction for as many parts places as you can. And I'm sure in five years when we do this again, James, you'll have, you'll even have further articulations and almost all of them will be to make the the life of the client easier for them to, to achieve their goals rather than, as you said, you know, beating indexes or whatnot. So um, when, when I'm talking about your actual team, and I did start this podcast by saying that building to a team of uh, 26 people in, in, in a handful of years is quite an achievement. You outlined how you structured it. But what I'm interested in is why people join you, um, why they stay. Um, and then, you know, once you've done that, because you are so 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 new relative to a 30-year business, why you think they're going to grow with you? So let's start with maybe why they join you. What sort of person comes to you and says, I want to be part of your previously known as in- insufficient, now known as sufficient funds philosophy, okay. James? So, I, I mean, I think, I think having that philosophy helps uh, and... And certainly, there's there's a strong drive. I mean, I, I, the way I frame this, and there's a there's actually a job ad on the on uh, the ensemble or the XY talent talent board right now um, is talent hub. I should say is that we kind of feel like we it's it's difficult to provide value for millennials, but everyone wants to do it, and I feel like we've nailed that. And so when it comes to that, that's a that's a big thing for our existing team. And, and they see that they're working on files of people that are similar to them or, you know, uh, have similar challenges. And that's really helpful because they can really engage in that. Um, and so I, I feel that's probably it. I think the, the motivation, the enthusiasm that we all have for what we're actually delivering here, it, it goes far beyond spitting out a plan that helps add financial value and I guess for us, that's the kind of person we're also looking to hire, um, and we, yeah, we do a few things that we're fairly careful about how we do that, uh, and that evolves each time we do it. Um, but at the moment, I think we've got a pretty good, pretty good process around that as well. And maybe before we get into the process, I'll just give you an anecdote. So I, I ran a, a financial planning practice, and we didn't call it millennials because they didn't exist at the time. But um, our our clients were typically uh, thirty to fifty because we were all in our thirties, and. Um, and we were attempting to tread the same path that you're doing with your clients. And for the first 10 years, um, you're doing that. And your clients, yeah, are, um, you know, relative to other clients, may not have the investable funds and whatnot. But I can tell you that as those people reach 40, 45, and head to 50, you end up with all the wealthy clients. So if I'm an advisor with you and I'm playing the long game, then um, you probably got more of a future ahead of you than, than a practice that, that potentially um, is not looking to re, reinvigorate itself from just being a, a, either a retirement only or, or whatnot, of which there are plenty of those, and I do speak with them, but you're starting here and, and riding that wave. Now, when you say you've got a couple of processes for, for um, recruiting or, or obtaining people, what's unique to you guys? I don't need to know your old process, but what do you think you do that's a little bit different? So, so something that we've tried a few times, and it's worked really well to to really cut the number of applications that we have to deal with, uh, which has been a challenge, especially if you know you go somewhere like Seek or something. But you end up with a heap of of things you have to work through, but you never know who you're dealing with, right? So we're we're working really hard on 
we we need high performers, but we also need the the, the right fit for us and and that cultural fit and the personality that comes with that, especially for things like the advisor role, uh, are really important. So we have uh, one hurdle that we found. Uh, and I'm not sure. I really wish people would would engage more with it. But have asking them to do a two minute video and send it to us uh, has has been um, something that works incredibly well. Uh, just really two simple questions: What do you you know? Tell us a bit about yourself, and why should we choose you? And I bet you know. I bet when you get the one that just stands out. Well, first of all, anyone who doesn't send that to you. Clearly, he's not going to perform very well in an environment where all your clients are We're see on you video. on video. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So that's quite a binary <laughs> sort of filter. But but when you get that that video and they just nail it, does your heart sink? Uh, it does, and that's my that's actually a problem that I have because the second part testing whether they're actually going to be a high performer. Uh, I get so bloody excited about um, <laughs> the the fact that we might have found the right person, and you can see it in their eyes when they talk to you. It, you still need to know that they have numerical ability and reasoning and and everything else that comes with it. And, so, and do you do that with like a psych test or a series of questions? What what's what's the the sort of the the granularity there? So we use um yeah we do use a psych test. We've actually got a couple that we we employ at different stages, I guess. And that is one of them is is Peep Logica. Uh, and big shout out to Corey at Verse for for getting me onto that one. Peep Logica is incredible for it's a, it's a big test. And what you do is you use it internally to map your ideal staff member, essentially. And so, from an advisor perspective, I did it. Uh, one of our other advisors have done it, and we've then collaborated on that. So, okay, well, with what we have, what's perfect there, and and then map the new person against that, uh, and that gives us. It's a bit of personality, but it's also numerical and and verbal reasoning and ability. So, it gives you the kind of full picture there. So, that's really helpful up front. Um, another one that we're introduced to more recently through our business coaches is uh, Wealth Dynamics. Uh, and the Wealth Dynamics is an incredible test where you get, it's a really short one, set up by a guy called Roger Hamilton. And you can look it up, but there's heaps you probably, you, you would absolutely know about this, like, no doubt, Roxy. But I guess you get eight profiles. And for us, really, there's only one profile in there that we feel works for an advisor that we need. And so there's a you know, the the star profile that comes out of that and what a star looks like. Um, it, it sounds it sounds egotistical, but it's very the op- it's very much the opposite. It's someone who doesn't mind the light shining on them, but they're also very happy to push that light onto someone else. And that's where as an advisor, if you've got that quality, you're you're already going into bat for your clients in every way. And that's what we need. Um we don't mind. Uh, we we use the Clifton Strengths Finder as well, but that's not an intern. That's not a hiring process. That's more of a you know longer term team engagement. Where does everyone fit and making decisions around that? Matt, well, that look, and I, I probably bored people with this comment of you've got to hire slow and fire fast. Um, today's we're not talking about how to fire, um, but we're talking about hire. What I might do is, um, yeah, well, I've also spoken to. To Corey and and he's mentioned uh, it's Peak Logica, isn't it? I might um just make sure we've got that link for that one. Also, Wealth Dynamics, and maybe just uh, loop back on on your business coach. I'm a big fan of being coached, um and and in fact, my business partner, as we speak today, was my business coach. Um, you know, how did you get involved with uh, your coach, and 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 what 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 what's the main thing that takeouts that you have? So, in terms of business coach. We are a part of the Abundance Global community, and so we joined that about 12 months ago. Actually, off a, re- for a reference from uh, our good friend Ben Nash, and um, we, you know, we, we saw them as a great team run by a really good guy, David David Dugan, uh, who's done a lot of work on himself, but then turned this into an incredible business that they then use to grow businesses, and and they deal with everyone, they work with everyone, so you get a bit of everything uh, in terms of. That. So we went through what they call their accelerator program sort of mid last year. It was 14 weeks of intensive work on this, work on that. And we just go through and you tick it all off and you graduate and then you go into what they call mastery. And so, um, yeah, these guys have been great for, we, I mean, we got to the point where with, I think it was 20 people in the team at the time, we looked at ourselves and we're like, we don't know what we don't know here. And the blind spots, if they are there, could be, could be fatal if we miss something really important. Uh, so, we, we need to really engage a coach and we had never done it before. And that was a, 
that was a big leap of faith, but it's so far so good. There's probably a few organisational structures here, uh, changes at play. Um, you know, this is an engine room podcast and, and you mightn't have realised it, but you did disclose that you're, you're seeing less and less of the client. So in many respects, you're also stepping into building the business of the business and where you have potentially had your blind spots, you probably didn't know that, you've now engaged a coach who is more than likely making sure that you're articulating your strengths and making sure that everyone's working at their best and highest use, which which probably helped you lead to to um, you know ditching the, the risk only and doing the holistic plans and the whole thing. I can see you nodding, but remember, this is a podcast. You can say yes, Andrew, if you want. <laughs> I, I, just don't want to, I, don't, I don't want to interrupt because you're so, it's, I actually really enjoy listening to you, mate. So, but yeah, I, I think you're absolutely right. And and there's a there's the element of you don't know what you don't know. And if, if you've got someone to plug those gaps, but it was also holding us accountable uh, for me. When you get busy, everything else falls away if, you, if, you're not, if you're not focused on the right things. And it just means if you know you're doing the right thing at the right time, you're so much more confident about just smashing it out, getting it done and moving on. Uh, and that was the biggest thing for me. And you've talked about your, your, how your team members are arranged, the tools they've got, the type of clients, the fact that there's just a river of opportunities for new clients coming in. How do you how do you arrange you know what are your meeting rhythms with your team? How do you know if they're doing a good job? Um, you know how do you how do re- maybe answer those and then I might ask you how do you celebrate? You know like how do you manage to celebrate those things when we probably grew up in an environment where everyone was in the one office? So let's start with the first question, which is you know how, what are your meeting rhythms? How do you build that consistency and how do you measure success with your team members? So, thank you. This is, mate, this is really timely because we're actually kind of reviewing this at the moment, or revisiting and looking to put in things like a weekly advisor meeting. So, currently the pods meet but not the advisors and it's just a, it's more of a bounce ideas and, and reflect so on just that. Just the pod, so the two ICs meeting at the moment running, they're almost running the, the private office of their advisor, is that right? Uh, with the advisor involvement, oh, but okay. yeah, that's cool. the yeah, absolutely. And um, but then you've got the so the pods meet, but there's that advisor. There's the value in just bringing the advisors together in in you know what did you do, what did you deal with, what went wrong, and and that's the stuff that you hear in an office, right? You hear that stuff, and it's the the coaching and the training that can come off the back of that. That's incredibly helpful. Um, we're looking at the the all in team meetings and bringing in a monthly all in team meeting and uh, at the moment what do we do we've got one on ones with the key uh, so most of the guys and and girls that report to me um, and so we've got uh, our monthly one on ones so to speak where we catch up about life and business and work and everything else um, but. In terms of the fact that we've grown so quickly, we just had to take stock and say, let's get some structure here. So we've got a bit of a plan in place there, but it will revolve around some advisor meetings um, weekly and then a monthly all in. Uh, and then we we use actually, and this probably helps that second part of that question was, you know, how do we how do we keep the camaraderie going and 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 all the chat around the office? We use Voxer. And so Voxer being a phone app, it's also desktop. That works for just the chit chat, all the random stuff. It's not client talk. It's not anything specific. Uh, we've got different channels and so forth, similar to Slack, but we use that in a way that, like, is a lot of fun stuff. We're sharing feedback. If someone gets a Google review, it goes in there. Just the stuff that really keep everyone pumped up. And 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 in relation to using Vox Voxer, how did you get your your um? global team members to sort of participate in that banter you know and, and and was there any tips or tricks you've got for other people to get to get your global team involved in that that chit chat so to speak so we i mean part of that comes from really pushing that because we we saw that as a as a need especially and and you know it's, it is right it is a challenge sometimes to have you know someone in the philippines feeling like they can give that feedback or say that joke or whatever it might be uh and so we just really actively encourage it and and asking questions i think is 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 a really important part taking an interest just as i as i promote strongly with the advisors for your clients take an interest in the team take an interest in what's going on for them um and you know we've got all sorts of hilarious stories that get shared in in there and different gifts and gifs that float around um some of the team in the Philippines are hands down the best at sharing the funniest things at the right time. So, yeah, they've uh, they've built confidence over the years. 
No, no, that's when that's look that that makes all the difference. There, there are going to be people listening to this engine room podcast where where they're um, looking at, at doing this exercise for the first time, and you've just given some pretty sage advice based on my experience there as well. Um, so, and, and as far as how do you celebrate? Um, do you guys ever get together physically, or or, or it maybe give us the feel for that? Yeah. So yeah, I sort of said we have a uh, we have an annual retreat. Uh, or that has been the case for the last two years. Uh, so it's um, it's certainly something we want to we want to try and make sure, uh, subject to performance, that we're able to do that. And uh, we were lucky enough to be able to bring one of our team members out last year from the Philippines. And uh, we have you know that that focus of getting everyone together. It gets a lot of work done sometimes, but it's also a good time to celebrate and do it properly. Uh, because that's very important as well. We also have monthly drinks, so we have the obligatory monthly drinks on Zoom, and uh, of course that's 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 a good one. But yeah, getting everyone together, and and also, but now that you know, we do have people all around the country, and and the team in the Philippines often get together face to face as well. Um, more of an ad hoc thing, but um, just having if you live anywhere near each other, we're now more intentional about okay, let's make this this and this person get together, and we'll we'll go and catch up. Now, with your with your future of your business, where do you see? So, I'll frame this question in two parts because you're clearly going through a journey from someone who was a business writer. You're now coached. You're, you're building out operational things. You're potentially putting the jigsaw puzzle in place with people, yeah. with the deliverables. You've done quite a lot of good things, but where does your business go from here in the next five years? And then the other part of it is. Where do you see, hence, the future of the practices in financial advice? Okay, so I mean, look, we've got a we, we could stop to to kind of through the business coaches. We started to try and create this idea of a ten year vision for us, uh, and that is a long way away. It's very difficult to do. That was quite a challenging exercise. But you know what came out of that is set the goals so damn high that then you can put the fence posts in place and join the dots and and do it in a do it in a methodical way and so I'd encourage anyone to really get stuck into that idea of just getting crazy with your vision and think about how big could it possibly be the uh, old so, big, big hairy audacious goal is one of the lingos isn't it that's right and and so that that idea of, you know call it a grand vision or whatever you want is it, it's it's really for us it's completely dominating financial planning and mortgage roguing for millennials, for driven millennials. And uh, those are the ones for us. It's people who want to seeking, they're actually out there to define, achieve and reach beyond sufficient funds is, is how we frame that. And, you know, we see the more value we can add and the more bells and whistles around that service is, is the ticket to that and at the same time scaling to the point that, you know, I, I guess, you know, so take a step back from that. We set annual two and three year goals that we're sharing with the team now as well in terms of revenue and client numbers and so forth. And so those are the those are the kind of short term build momentum. And then if you know we're gonna we're gonna hit the bigger stuff in ten years time, we've got to we've got to hit one and two and three in the first place and and move from there. So when when it comes to the industry itself and and where I think practices need to go, it's it's very much about embracing tech it's very much about realizing that you know that traditional soa which may no longer be necessary uh is is going to be something with that merger for for the soa to and then the use of tech to really bring that alive for clients ai we're seeing now is already already completely changing the way people can create content and and have conversations and and all of that, and obviously we know that's going to completely blow the world up in a positive way, ideally, in the next few years. And I think it's very important that we all, as as practice owners, but anyone in the business, is involved in just understanding that type of thing at its core. Really making sure you provide a relevant offering to the people you work with best. So it's fair to say you've targeted your clients, but you're also targeting your team members. So what's the type? of team member that you would like to have service your millennial client base? Because in case you do rewind this podcast, you did use the word dominate, which is a pretty pretty definitive and, and aggressive word, which I loved. But so <laughs> what does what's your ideal team member look like? Not just because your, your, your current one's going to be listening, but, but, you know, we spoke earlier, you're in the market to grow 
people at any part of your team, or any any facet of your team. So what do they look like? So, I mean, the job ad right now uh, on your platform is is out there for advisors and, and we're keen to hire one or two uh, as soon as possible. But like you said, hire slow, uh, th- put everyone through the right hoops. But in terms of what we're looking there at for there, it, it really is emotionally intelligent humans. It's people who can connect and, and that goes for anyone in the business. We want we want because you have to be able to work remotely you've got to be able to have those conversations and be able to understand how people might take what you say uh the wrong way if you say it in a certain way and it's that idea of emotional intelligence as well as the intelligence that comes uh you know ideally with someone working in the financial planning world we need smart people um and that's where those profiling tools really helpful uh in in terms of what we're looking for there it's it's enthusiastic motivating people they don't we're we're all pretty young uh and i I mean my clients and and a lot of the team would call me old uh but but we're not we're not against hiring someone who's who's more senior than i might be um for the fact that they'll bring bring something slightly different to to what we are offering at the moment uh, the core and the key there is they have to understand and want to relate and work with the people that we're working with. Uh, and so, yeah. So I think when, when I, I asked you to sort of the practice the future, I think you've reiterated what quite a few of my guests have said, which is um, being very clear at the, the target market you're after um, and making sure that the, the operational business that you've built um, complements that target market. I think the concept of a, of, of, of a jack of all trades or, or a general store in, in financial planning is very hard to price. It's very hard to attract and retain the talent. And it's just confusing in the marketplace. And, that, and that's one of the, the takeouts there as well. And I would, I would safe to say that um, people don't start with that emotional intelligence. And one of the, um, the upsides of being involved in Ensemble is that, that we see people grow in, um, in, in their peer-to-peer. So not just do you have the ability to, to craft your advisors talking to other advisors and power planners, but they've got that ability to talk to other people. And as you intimated up front, there's no, no competition there. It's been one of our more, more, more satisfying things is seeing, uh, you know, people, people's uh, ability to relate and have that emotional intelligence increase, not as a function of education in the traditional way, but as a function of relating and communicating with their peers. Absolutely right. And and I think that it comes down that that that's the core of what we would look for, and I think most people would be looking for in the sense of any partner or any staff member. It is about understanding that there's a connection there, and you can make that connection, and you can understand when they're not feeling up for that conversation that you think you need to have. Uh, and so, yeah, we're very open and, and always keen to you know work with and partner with like-minded businesses. We're keen for advisors. Um, and, but, but to be honest, uh, you know, as a growing business, there's, there's opportunities coming up quite regularly as well. Oh, well, look, thank you very much for your, your time today, James. And, and, and thank you very much for opening the lid on, on the, that, that niche. What's well, another, when I say niche, there's a lot of people are in that age group, right? Um, yeah. And, and how you're intending on servicing them, your philosophy around that one team, um, right down to a bit of honesty around how you've now increased the accountability by bringing on a business coach, um, by, by, by going through that program. You know, people don't start being awesome as a practice or a CEO, and it's a journey. And, and it, people in your team don't have to start day one being awesome, provided they've got those, those, that yeah. intent and that requirement and that empathy. They can grow with you as they can with many other quality quality practices. And with, with that in mind, this is all about lifting lids on, on, on practice management in Australia, lifting lid on the, the, the wonderful, I suppose, and colourful different ways in which uh, you know, our community is servicing different people um, in, in, in Australia and, and kind of getting away from um, the, the binary kind of you're in or out or we do this or you don't. Um, we are very good in financial planning at actually caring for our clients and by building a great quality engine room, it gives our advice community the opportunity and the air to do their best. Um, with that in mind, James, look, thank you very much for your time. And I wish I wish you and Sufficient Funds all the best. And I hope that 
I only have a handful of insufficient fund things come out of my ATM um, for if, for the limited amount of time that they'll exist in the future. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely, Roxy, mate. Thank you so much to you and the whole Ensemble crew. Thanks for having me on. I appreciate the call up. And yeah, I hope that's been helpful. And yeah, that you guys are doing some amazing work. And if you want any details in relation to to uh, the sufficient funds business, there'll be links here. And and as uh, James has already pointed out, he's he's got a an active uh, an active ad out there for people as well. Look, have a great evening, James. Take care. Thanks, mate. Cheers.